So she comes crawling out of the bathroom and she's on all fours on the, on the bedroom floor. I said, come on, look, go to bed, baby. Everything's going to be all right. And she says, I need you to get out of this bed and come rub my back. And I was like, all right, that's, I, I know that, right? Let me get up, rub this woman's back. We have two natural childbirths. Both of them transpired in our bedroom, on the bedroom floor. Um, Andrew, our first child, was born at 2.23 in the morning. Amari was born at 5.40 in the afternoon. Um, we knew that we wanted to have natural childbirth each time. Mm -hmm. um, because Ryan made me watch, or not made me watch, he said, watch this with me. And we watched the business of being born, right? Ricky Lake's documentary about how things were being geared towards C-sections and hospitals and they hit you with Pitocin and then the contractions get more intense and then all of a sudden they got to go in, snip, snip, snip. Right. She said, I don't want that. She said, I would love to have my, my, my babies naturally. I think that my body is meant for this. I said, I support you, right? And what I wasn't prepared for was the level of strong opinions of people who thought that we were cuckoo for cover, right? So we went to a birthing center and we took birthing class. And what I love about the midwifery practice is there's something very whole person about it. It wasn't just sort of going in every six weeks, 12 weeks, four weeks for a checkup and the doctor telling you, you're good, you got checking your vitals, doing a quick ultrasound or what have you. But you're there like, they took your blood pressure. They asked like how you were eating, how you've been drinking your, with your water. You know, have you been exercising? Like there's something very catering to the whole person. So it put Ryan at ease in a way that her OBGYN by himself could not because the first time we did concurrent care. So we would go see her Western medicine OBGYN and then we would go see the midwife. Every time she went to go see the OBGYN and she felt a little stressed out, you know? And he's like, I don't know why you're trying to do this craziness. You know what I'm saying? All kinds of things can happen with a child. And I was like, all right, well, let's, there are concerns. And the midwifery practice said, like, if you are beyond a certain point, like if you are 10 days past your due date, then you have to go to the hospital. What I loved was how well she felt taken care of. Mm -hmm. And so we were going to go to the birthing center for Andrew. And her mom came early because she thought Andrew was going to, her mom thinks she has sight. And so she thought Andrew was going to be born at a certain time. And Andrew was a week late. Mm -hmm. So she was hanging out for a while. We were watching a rerun of the BET Awards and her mom's like, well, I'm gonna leave. Leave you guys to it. And we're like, all right, see you later. She left at 11 p.m. and Ryan had her first contraction, right? And Ryan was like, ooh, what's that? I was like, I think that was a contraction, right? Because I'm timing stuff, you know what I'm saying? Like 15 minutes later, she had another one. <laughs> and she's like, oh, man, that's crazy. And I was like, yeah, that is kind of crazy. I was like, but everybody tells you, you can't, your first baby's gonna take like 24 hours. You know what I'm saying? Have a glass of wine, try to get some rest, blase skip. So this broad is laying down in bed. She's got this hypnobirth thing that she's listening to. We are crunchy, but like, she's even crunchier than me. She's listening to her hypnobirth thing, trying to go to sleep. After 20 minutes, she's like, I gotta get up, I gotta use the bathroom. I was like, okay. So I'm laying down in bed. It's like almost midnight. She comes back to the bed after she uses the restroom. She's like, okay, cool, cool, cool. Listens to hypnobirth and she's like, I got to use the bathroom again. So then the contractions start coming even more frequently. <clears throat> and I'm trying to coax her back to bed because they tell you, it can't happen that fast. So she comes crawling out of the bathroom and she's on all fours on the, on the bedroom floor. I said, come on, look, go to bed, baby. Everything's going to be all right. And she says, I need you to get out of this bed and come rub my back. And I was like, all right, that's, I, I know that, right? Let me get up, 
rub this woman's back. So you're doing all these things to where you like, you lift the hips, you push them together to try to relieve pressure off the lower back. And that works for a second and then it doesn't. So we go through all these things and she's finally, she's like, I think I'm crowning, right? I said, sweetheart, you can't be crowning. It's way too soon. She's like, all right. So she picks up the phone and starts dialing 911. And I'm calling the midwife because the, they have a hotline for the midwife. But at the end of the line that they give you, there's another number that you have to listen for if, you, if it's an emergency. Mm -hmm. So you have to listen to the message for the new number at the end. And every time we get to the end so I can write down the new number to call, Ryan has a contraction. Now, at this point, she's a grad school trained actress who speaks from the diaphragm. So every time she has a contraction, it's like, ah. I said, sweetheart, I can't feel the number. So I have to call back multiple times before I get the number. She gives me her phone. I got like the dispatcher saying like, is there an emergency? I was like, yeah, we can use the paramedics. We're at this address. And they're like, okay. So the paramedics are coming. I finally get the midwife on the phone. And I put her on speaker. And I look down in between Ryan's legs. Not only is she crowning, but Andrew's head is all the way out. She's on all fours. I look in between her legs, his head is out. Midwife, ice cold. She's like, oh, that's fantastic. She said, just wait for mommy to push again and collect the baby and place him or her on mommy's chest because we didn't know what we were having so they can start bonding. Sure enough, on all fours, she pushes again. His body wriggles all the way out, wriggles out. The umbilical cord was around the ankle, so I undid it from around his ankle. And you have to imagine that the baby's in the back. So I have to pass the baby through her legs up so she can lean back, put the baby on her chest. First of all, he did me a joy. He started crying as soon as I took him out. So I didn't have to like, you know, do any of that type of stuff. Put him on her chest. And then he starts rooting around, looking for the nipple. And that was our first baby, right? Now then, <laughs> the paramedics came and they're like, hey, how you doing? We're all good? I was like, yeah, man, we got a baby. It was like two minutes later, Ryan's booty ass naked. Baby just sitting up on top of her and they put things on to check her vitals. She's good. And they're like, all right, let's go to the hospital. They're like, no, we're cool. We're crunchy black people. We're gonna stay at the crib. The midwife is on the way, right? They're like, all right, so you got to sign something saying y'all crunch your black people. You don't want to go to the hospital. So sign the paper saying we didn't want to go to the hospital. Two minutes after that, our midwife shows up and she's got like this little spelunking light on her head. She got a little black bag. I'm, like, I'm a you know, licensed midwife. She comes in, she tends to Ryan. She's there in time to co coax out the placenta. Um, our doula is there as well. And she immediately starts to encapsulate the placenta so that Ryan can take it for postpartum, et cetera. And the most hairy, the, the coolest thing about this particular experience was that Ryan had to have a, she had a small tear and so she needed a few stitches. And the midwife was like, okay, so if you want it to look the way that it did, you know, we have to stitch you up. Da, da, da. And she's like, so you gonna stick that needle where? It took her like 40 minutes to work up the nerve, way longer than like the delivery to make sure that she could get herself stitched up. And as she was getting stitched, I laid down in the bed next to her as Andrew took a nap on my chest. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, you don't get to do this in a hospital. Like this would never go down like this. I mean, I remember like the, what's the tar like, uh, that first bowel movement, uh, oh. meconium or something. I remember like I was, just, was waxing his booty up with as much oil as possible so I could wipe it off when it came out. It's still, you still got to do it, but it, I was able to do it and it, it was me. Like it wasn't, he wasn't off in another room and then somewhere, which is however it goes down, that's everybody's story and everybody's story is exactly the way it's supposed to be. I'm, I'm very happy and, and privileged that ours went. What did you guys do to prepare for this process? 
So we went to the sanctuary and they had a birthing class every week. It was a 10 week birthing class. And I can remember there's some cer certain things that were sort of ingrained in me. Like there's the mucus plug. You know, like just because the mucus blood comes out doesn't mean you're necessarily about to go into labor. And I remember Ryan walking around and she's like, I think my mucus plug just broke. And I could see it like slide down her thigh. And I was like, oh yeah, it's a mucus plug. I was like, okay, cool. You know, so it's about to be on and popping, but like not necessarily right now. So it was almost like I wasn't going to freak out because I had all of this information about how things typically go, but hers was atypical. Like it was two and a half hours, three and a half hours between her first contraction and the delivery of the child. Did you ever think about childbirth and pregnancy before having a child? I think when she showed me the video, I was open in a way that I would not have been as a younger man. I'd be like, this is weird. Like you gotta go to a hospital. You gotta be safe, you gotta take care of yourself. And then if you talk to people who are in the medical industry, going to Stanford, I got a lot of friends who are doctors and stuff, and they just looking at you like, I don't know, bro, you know? I was like, I understand what y'all saying. And there are things that you have to take into consideration. I think you need to do your due diligence um, as to whether or not you are a good candidate for a natural home birth, right? But once you make that determination, so much of what happens here takes place here that I was really delighted to, to see how they treated her as a whole person. It wasn't just um, the science of it. It was like, what's going on in your soul? Because all of that contributes to what this whole process is going on. you think that from your experience, um, men, can contribute to the overall wellness, health, the uh, spiritual, emotional, physical um, need that is a pregnant mother? Um, do you think that men can play a role in positively impacting that process? Absolutely. It's the role is minimal, but it is essential. Because if you bring strife or stress into the home, then that affects the person who's delivering this child. It affects the mom. Also, there's something that you have to do as a man, which is really important. And I wish I had somebody tell me this the first time around. So this is to all new time fathers, is that you necessarily cannot come first for an extended period of time. We're used to coming first, whether it's like sort of sexual needs, desires, etc. You have to come in second place to your child, right? And that happens for a long time Sometimes during the childbirth, like after the child first comes into the world, and there is an inherent selfishness in men that have a tough time comprehending, well, how come things ain't like they was before? How come we ain't, you know, blah, blah, blah. The flip is, if everybody is attentive to the fact that things have changed, and that they want to get back to a place that feels like a new norm. Not necessarily what it was before, but how are things going to be for us as we move forward? If everybody feels heard, it's a much easier road to endure than if everybody's like, well, she act like she don't want to be with me. It's like, well, he act like I ain't doing nothing for this child. Like it, that just makes things kind of go like that. But people, both mother and father have to be heard and understood in order to reconnect with one another in whatever time frame that takes. But you have to be like, okay, this is not about me right now. I can't take this person right now. She's growing the child that I asked for. So, yeah. Perfect. I think that's it. Okay. I really do. Okay. <laughs>